Uh, may I have your attention, please? As chairman, I'd like to welcome you to this business conference of the CEOs that uh, we hold every other year, and this is the other year. And uh, because of the leadership in this room and people such as the chairman Greenspan and chairman Grasso and, and chairman LaFalche and many of you, uh, we will not witness the 22% drop. Uh, this is the anniversary, according to the news this morning, in the 80s when we had the largest break in the prices in the stock market. This is the anniversary. I believe it's 1987. Um, at any rate, uh, we are very uh, happy to have all of you here and regret that uh, we weren't able to have the event over on in the Senate side as we usually have and that the speakers... Uh, which were scheduled, uh, Senator Lieberman, Senator Trent Lott, and Dick Eppard, Congressman Dick Eppard, uh, were all going to brief you and give you some good insights as to where we're going socially, economically, which is very, very helpful. But unfortunately, uh, the House is shut down, the Senate stayed working, and I understand there's a little rhubarb that goes back and forth right now, if I'm not uh, mistaken, John, uh, that... Uh, the House thought the Senate was going to adjourn, and so the House announced they adjourned, and the Senate didn't adjourn. And now one is open and the other is shut down, and uh, they're each blaming the other for having broken the understanding that they had. But that's nothing new on Capitol Hill. But uh, I want to uh, thank you for all being here, and uh, uh, thanking also Alan Greenspan for uh, being with us uh, many times in the past as an outstanding friend of NIAF, and uh, we really appreciate your wisdom, your words, and your leadership, Alan. <clears throat> I'd like to also give my profound thanks to our true leader, Dick Grasso, uh, who, this is not only his signature conference, and he holds business conferences in Europe for NIAF, as well as here in the United States, but he has uh, really uh, been there every time we've asked him. Uh, he has uh, shown the kind of leadership that we're very, very proud of. And one of the particular things that I want to single out was the response that Dick Rasso gave at the Twin Tower, the carnage that happened on September 11th. <clears throat> because of his leadership, a message was sent to the world. Three working days after, it was on Monday, it was open on Tuesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday were the three closed days of the stock market after the Twin Towers disaster. He did the extraordinary thing against all odds of sending a message to the world that our markets are alive and well, and we all thank you for that, Dick. <laughs> now, I want to bring on an old colleague and friend of mine, We've traveled together, we worked together in Capitol Hill, a man who I have the greatest respect for. He is a senior ranking member of the Finance Committee. Uh, he has uh, passed landmark, uh, landmark legislation on uh, complex finance bills, uh, our banking and monetary system. Uh, he has uh, authored legislation concerning the laundering funds of the terrorists and how to uh, disturb the finance net network of the terrorists. He's a leader in trade and development and uh, world debt, which are very important subject matters uh, that have been under discussion for years in Capitol Hill. But uh, his leadership, his experience, his boldness, his foresteadedness, his insistence on doing the right thing has caused uh, much important legislation to be passed on financial matters. So uh, we want to welcome uh, a great leader that we have who hails from Niagara Falls, which is where my mother's people come from. So in a sense, you were uh, sort of semi-related, John. John LaFalls, Congressman John LaFalls. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Calabresi, Frank Guarini, <laughs> and uh, Mr. President uh, Joe Sorrell. Joe Sorrell, your great, great president, uh, 
and I travel to Calabria in uh, April of this year, and we had one of the most magnificent times ever. Um, and, and speaking of Calabria, we also went to a little city in Italy called Rome, which is within the region of Lazio. And we're fortunate today, we have the president of the region of Lazio with us, the Honorable Francesco Storacci. Will he please stand? <laughs> and we all had a magnificent meal right now, but I want you to know somebody paid for it, <laughs> somebody hosted it, and then somebody happens to be one of the largest financial institutions in the world, Citigroup. And we are indebted to Citigroup. We thank Citigroup, and they are represented here by Roger Levy and Francis Aldrich Sevilla Circaza. Well, Roger, I want you to remain seated. Francis, I would like you to stay on that table now. <laughs> okay. That's, that's called putting your best face forward, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. This is a record-breaking event because it is the first luncheon under the leadership of the new executive director of NIAF, John Solomon. John, congratulations <laughs> to you. Uh, but the, the father of this luncheon, and the person who I now have the pleasure and honor of introducing. I, uh, I first met uh, Richard Grasso when he was president of the New York Stock Exchange. And I asked around because I always wondered what these titles mean. And uh, some people are presidents, some people are chairman, etc. And they said, this means that he is Mr. Inside. He really runs the place. And without a question, he has been the best inside person that the New York Stock Exchange has ever had. And then the position of chairman came up. And some people view that as the outside, you know, the half by the inside and outside halfbacks. Well, Dick Grasso uh, was selected to be. Mr. Outside also, in addition to Mr. Uh, uh, Inside, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, the most important stock exchange in the world. And I personally believe, and I think I speak for all those who've come in contact with him, he's been the best chairman the New York Stock Exchange has ever had. And, and, uh, September 11th and September 12th, uh, and all the days ensuing, how comforting it was for us to know uh, that at the helm of the most important stock exchange in the world, at the helm of not only the Central Bank of the United States, but what most people view, I think, most appropriately as, in a sense, the central bank for the world, and I know Ellen would deny that, but because of its influence, it is. How good it was to know that we had individuals at the helm like Richard Grasso and Alan Greenspan. They proved themselves, as they've been proving themselves every single day for years and years and will continue to do. And so with that, it is my, my great pleasure to call upon the vice chairman of NIAF, and the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Grasso. Thank you very much. <clears throat> John, you, uh, you are very sweet, and I'm very humbled by your very beautiful words, but I would be the first to tell you that there were so many men and women in the business of Wall Street who, for perhaps the only time in my 34 years at the New York Stock Exchange, basically took off their respective competitive jerseys, be they Citigroup, 
Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, and so many of the other great broker-dealers who serve almost 85 million Americans in this uh, marketplace that, as you quite rightly say, has become the most important market in the world. They took off those Team jerseys and they put on their Team America jerseys and made that marketplace reopen. What took 209 years to build was basically rebuilt in three and a half days because of thousands of wonderful men and women, not just within the securities industry, but from Verizon and Con Ed, and of course the great leadership that we had from the public sector. And that is my, uh, my privilege this afternoon. I first want to welcome all of you to this conference. This is a conference that has traditionally been one of the most important parts of our weekend because it allows the National Italian American Foundation in this its 26th annual gala weekend to bring together the leadership from corporate America, from institutional around the world and to focus on what is important to us. This conference, although as uh, Frank indicated, we had to cancel the morning session, this conference has over the, uh, the course of the last now seven years had the privilege of having the presence of the greatest chairman in the history of the Federal Reserve. I'm allowed to say that he's not. Uh, Alan Greenspan over the last 14 years has managed the Fed through periods of challenge unprecedented in our nation's history. And the events following September 11th, while incredibly challenging to our nation and to the world, and certainly the market's reaction to this heinous crime committed not just against America, but committed against all who cherish freedom, all who practice the system that we have come to know and love in this country, realize citizens of 80 nations perished in those two towers when they went down. This was not a simple attack upon America. It was an attack upon the world. And the partnership that quickly was formed between the private sector and those in public policy could not have been stronger and I could not have been more proud of the role that the president played in coming to New York on the, uh, on the Friday, rallying the spirits of not just those at Ground Zero, but of all Americans as he gave that so, so stirring speech with a fireman at his side. The mayor, Rudy Giuliani, whom I now have to address as Sir Rudy. Uh, <clears throat> and the leadership that we got from here in Washington, from the Fed and from the Treasury, all on one thematic, which was restoring the marketplace as a symbol to these criminals, that they could take the lives of innocent people they could destroy property, but they would never destroy the American ideal. Of course, the, the person central to the operations of markets is the person at the helm of the Federal Reserve. Alan Greenspan, in 14 years, has seen it all. As Frank indicated, this day, 14 years ago, the market declined 22% in a single session. Cast that in current context, that would be almost 2,300 Dow points pre this temporary market interruption. <clears throat> the chairman, unlike any in the past, liquefied the system. Chairman Greenspan saw the challenges of 1989 when the Dow again saw a precipitous drop in the month of October. He saw the Asian contagion and what it did to markets around the world, including here. 
And of course, he dealt with long-term capital management and the need to liquefy the markets under the most trying of circumstances when people could not quantify the potential risk to our economic infrastructure. This is a chairman that over the course of the last 14 years has come to guide our economy to the longest period of economic expansion in our nation's history. This is a chairman who has served this nation over the course of four decades as chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, as chairman of President Reagan's Commission on Social Security Reform, first appointed by President Ronald Reagan, reappointed by George Bush, 41, reappointed by Bill Clinton, and I'm hopeful that the incumbent president in the year of my 100th birthday will reappoint Chairman Alan Greenspan. Uh, no, no chairman, no chairman of the Federal Reserve, and I'm allowed to say this because the first president of the New York Stock Exchange went on to become the longest serving chairman of the Fed, William McChesney Martin, a great, great American and a great man and a great mentor. Um, but I think if, if Bill Martin were here, he would say, given the 14 years, given the brilliance of leadership, there is no one to compare, ladies and gentlemen, to the chairman who has addressed this group on five occasions, including today. And as I said to him, with this fifth appearance, he now becomes a citizen of Italy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, truly, the truly extraordinary leader, quarterback of our nation's economic expansion, and a person who, at the helm, come the 11th of September, you knew was going to be in the position to make it all work. Ladies and gentlemen, NIAF is again honored to have as its luncheon speaker today, the Honorable Alan Greenspan. Fellow Italian Americans, <laughs> I'm um, I'm privileged to become one of you, and uh, trust that, uh, uh, unlike a good deal of legislation that passes in this city, uh, there's no sunset on that particular designation. <laughs> Let me just say first, Dick, I very, first very much appreciate your very kind introduction. But like you who were aware of the people who worked with you, under you, uh, side you through all of those various serious periods, uh, the one thing that's impressed me more than anything else in the 14 years that uh, I've been chairman of the Fed is what an extraordinary institution of people that is. It turns out, as you're probably aware, that at the time of the bombing, I was halfway across the Atlantic, essentially incommunicado. And while uh, I would like to say that I picked up the phone on the plane and gave instructions to do X, Y, and Z, the truth of the matter, of course, is one, I couldn't, and much more importantly, it wasn't necessary because the Federal Reserve has got a remarkably deep bench. And uh, Roger Ferguson, who was the only one around, our vice chair, just took over, ran the ship. I got back into Zurich, got him on the phone, and he went through the various things we had done. And uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I might as well just have kept flying. It didn't really matter all that much. 
And I think we're all very fortunate to have public servants uh, of the nature that people, the Federal Reserve System, and I must say to you that as uh, uh, much as I've been interested in the really quite remarkable period which both you and I have been through, uh, having been associated with that group, uh, especially in periods of crisis, has been an, just a fascinating period for me, and I know uh, with the contacts you and I and our colleagues had in these two crucial periods, uh, it's been something we're always going to remember. And I might say to you that uh, I'd very much like to uh, take up your offer about uh, uh, your hundredth birthday, my being reappointed, but uh, I'm planning to be uh, on the senior tennis tour at that time, so <laughs> I'm not, not available. A couple of days ago, I uh, put together a general view of what I thought the American economy was headed into and wh where we have been uh, before, in, before your colleagues on the Joint Economic Committee. And what I'd like to do is to share a summary uh, of what it is I try to put together at that particular time. And uh, indeed, since it's a very rare event that Nothing of substance has happened in the last two days to change the speech, uh, which I must tell you is uh, unusual, to say the least. Uh, uh, I'd like to just to, uh, to bring you up to date in what is really quite a remarkable period in American economic history. And indeed, we're going to look back on this period and realize uh, what it is we've learned about how the system functions and who we are as a people. And so far, I must say, I'm not only proud to be an Italian-American, but I am proud to be an American. Despite the tragic events of September the 11th, the foundations of our free society remain sound, and I am confident that we will recover and prosper as we have in the past. But before the recovery process gets underway, stability will need to be restored to the American economy and to others around the world. Arguably, that stability was only barely becoming evident in the United States in the period immediately preceding the act of terrorism. Aggregate measures of production, employment, and business spending continue to be weak in August. Consumer spending, however, moved higher that month and appeared to be reasonably well maintained in the first part of September. Industry analysts suggest that motor vehicle sales were running close to August levels and chain store sales were only modestly lower. New orders for non-defense capital goods stabilized in August. Moreover, the dramatic decline in the rate of profits was clearly slowing, and also slowing were expectations of where profits were going to emerge during the third and fourth quarters. To be sure, all of these signs were tentative, but generally on the whole, definitely encouraging. In the days following that attack, of course, the level of activity declined quite significantly. The shock was most evident in consumer markets as many potential purchasers stayed riveted to their televisions and away from shopping malls. Both motor vehicle sales and sales at major chain stores fell off noticeably. The airline and travel industries also suffered severe cutbacks. The unprecedented shutdown of American air travel and tightened border restrictions induced dramatic curtailments of production at some establishments with tight, just-in-time supply chain practices, most notably, most notably in the motor vehicle industry. As the initial shock began to wear off, 
economic activity recovered somewhat from the depressed levels that immediately followed the attacks, though the recovery has clearly been uneven to date. Markedly increased incentives induced a sharp rebound in motor vehicle sales by the end of last month that has carried apparently undiminished to date through October. However, many retailers of other consumer goods report that sales have only partially retraced the steep drops that occurred in mid-September. Fortunately, air freight is largely back to normal, and obviously that means that a lot of the supply chain problems which were created for us with the shutdown of airline travel have been uh, removed, although there are still some problems out there. Overall, airline passenger traffic, while above its mid-September lows, was still off considerably in early October from pre-attack levels. Similarly, the hospitality and entertainment industries have overcome some of their earlier difficulties, but continue to struggle. The effect on financial markets of the devastating attack on the World Trade Center was pronounced as telecommunications and trading capacities were severely impaired, as Richard implied and spoke to. But the markets are mostly functioning normally now, and as in the past, the infrastructure will be rapidly restored. For a brief time, the terrorist attacks markedly disrupted payment transfers, leaving those counting on receiving payments caught short. Those needs ultimately were met by the Federal Reserve, both through record lending at the discount window and through an extraordinary infusion of funds through open market operations. To facilitate the channeling of dollar liquidity to foreign financial institutions operating in the United States, 30-day currency swap lines were arranged with major central banks, again in record volumes. It was essential in such an environment to meet all appropriate demands for dollar liquidity. As repair of the financial markets and payment in infrastructure proceeded apace, loans were repaid, open market operations could be scaled back, the unusual swap lines were allowed to expire, and the temporarily bloated balance sheet of the Federal Reserve largely returned to normal. But even as market functioning and liquidity flows were restored, the potential for heightened uncertainty to damp household and business spending for a time persisted. To cushion these effects, we at the Fed have eased the stance of monetary policy appreciably since September the 11th. We in the United States have assumed ourselves to be fairly well insulated from terrorism, or at most subject to limited and sporadic episodes similar to those previously observed on a number of occasions in Europe. We have been aware of the possibility for losses on a much greater scale, but I suspect that those possibilities were deemed so remote that they were never seriously incorporated into most conventional assessments of economic risk. The shock of the tragedies at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon has reshaped those assessments of risk and required an abrupt realignment of prices in many markets to reflect the expected costs of operating in what we now recognize as a more hostile world. The circumstances pose a difficult challenge for business decision making, not so much because the costs are inordinately large, but because the events which have potentially substantial consequences are so uncertain. Insurance deals with this problem by spreading the risk and converting potential large unknown costs into a steady stream of known insurance premiums that facilitates the forward planning so essential to an effective business operation. Obviously, 
sharp increases in insurance premiums for all forms of businesses are to be expected. Some higher insurance costs, in effect, will be borne implicitly rather than explicitly as firms choose to self-insure, at least in part, rather than lay off all of this risk in the marketplace. These higher insurance costs, both explicit and implicit, endeavor to anticipate future losses. But in addition, they cover the physical capital and labor resources businesses will be required to devote to enhanced security and to increased redundancies as protection against interruption of supplies or production. For example, the degree of comfort businesses have in allowing inventories to shrink to minimal levels in a just-in-time supply chain is clearly lessened. In this regard, increased security threats not pooled through insurance have exactly the opposite effect on productivity than that which is gained by an improvement in information technology. In addition to the loss of human life and capital assets, these are important collateral costs associated with the new threats that we now face. The pronounced rise in uncertainty also has damped consumer spending and capital investment. Households and businesses confronted with heightened uncertainty have pulled back from the marketplace, though that withdrawal has been partial and presumably temporary. The very great economic uncertainties that have arisen in the current environment have also, at least temporarily, resulted in a widening of bond spreads on high-yield instruments. Markets across our economy will adjust to the altered perceptions of risk that we now confront. Critical to that adjustment process is the behavior of consumers and business people. Behavior is difficult to predict in circumstances such as those we have experienced in the past five weeks. But judging from history, human beings have demonstrated a remarkable capacity to adapt to extraordinarily adverse circumstances. And I expect the same adaptability to become evident in the present situation. Although it is difficult to determine with any precision, it seems quite likely that a significant repricing of risk has already found its way into our markets, as many economic decisions are responding to shifting market signals. But these adjustments in prices and in the associated allocation of resources, when complete, represent one-time level adjustments without necessary implications for our longer-term growth prospects. Indeed, the exploitation of available networking and other information technologies was only partially completed when the cyclical retrenchments of the past year began. High-tech equipment investment at elevated rates of return will most likely resume once very high uncertainty premiums recede to more normal levels. The level of productivity will presumably undergo a one-time downward adjustment as our economy responds to higher levels of perceived risk. But once the adjustment is completed, productivity growth should resume at rates in excess of those that prevailed in the quarter century preceding 1995. It is worth noting that increased production to enhance security will be counted in measured output without contributing to our standards of living, as was the case during our military buildup of the Cold War. Our productivity measures have always endeavored to capture increased productive efficiency, not increased well-being. 
We are, in effect, currently using part of our increase in efficiency to supply increased security. Of course, given the heightened risks we face, these investments in security are doubtless quite sound. In any event, such costs are likely to fall short of the costs we incurred for security during the height of the Cold War. Nobody has the capacity to fathom fully how the effects of the tragedy of September 11th will play out in our economy. But in the weeks ahead, as the initial shock continues to wear off, we should be able to better gauge how the ongoing dynamics of these events are shaping the immediate economic outlook. For the longer term, prospects for ongoing rapid technological advance and associated faster productivity growth are scarcely diminished. Those prospects born of the ingenuity of our people and the strength of our system fortify a promising future for our free nation. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. We resume once very high uncertainty premiums recede to more normal levels. The level of productivity will presumably undergo a one-time downward adjustment as our economy responds to higher levels of perceived risk. But once the adjustment is completed, productivity growth should resume at rates in excess of those that prevailed in the quarter century preceding 1995. It is worth noting that increased production to enhance security will be counted in measured output without contributing to our standards of living, as was the case during our military buildup of the Cold War. Our productivity measures have always endeavored to capture increased productive efficiency, not increased well-being. We are, in effect, currently using part of our increase in efficiency to supply increased security. Of course, given the heightened risks we face, these investments in security are doubtless quite sound. In any event, such costs are likely to fall short of the costs we incurred for security during the height of the Cold War, an environment to meet all appropriate demands for dollar liquidity. As repair of the financial markets and payment in infrastructure proceeded apace, loans were repaid, open market operations could be scaled back, the unusual swap lines were allowed to expire, and the temporarily bloated balance sheet of the Federal Reserve largely returned to normal. But even as market functioning and liquidity flows were restored, the potential for heightened uncertainty to damp household and business spending for a time persisted. To cushion these effects, we at the Fed have eased the stance of monetary policy appreciably since September the 11th. We in the United States have assumed ourselves to be fairly well insulated from terrorism or at most subject to limited and sporadic episodes similar to those previously observed on a number of occasions in Europe. We have been aware of the possibility for losses on a much greater scale, but I suspect that those possibilities were deemed so remote that they were never seriously incorporated into most conventional assessments of economic risk. The shock of the tragedy physical capital and labor resources businesses will be required to devote to enhanced security and to increased redundancies as protection against interruption of supplies or production. For example, the degree of comfort businesses have in allowing inventories to shrink to minimal levels in a just-in-time 
supply chain is clearly lessened. In this regard, increased security threats not pooled through insurance have exactly the opposite effect on productivity than that which is gained by an improvement in information technology. In addition to the loss of human life and capital assets, these are important collateral costs associated with the new threats that we now face. The pronounced rise in uncertainty also has damped consumer spending and capital investment. Households and businesses confronted with heightened uncertainty have pulled back from the marketplace, though that withdrawal has been partial and presumably temporary. The very great economic uncertainties that have arisen in the current environment have also increased productive efficiency, not increased well-being. We are, in effect, currently using part of our increase in efficiency to supply increased security. Of course, given the heightened risks we face, these investments in security are doubtless quite sound. In any event, such costs are likely to fall short of the costs we incurred for security during the height of the Cold War. Nobody has the capacity to fathom fully how the effects of the tragedy of September 11th will play out in our economy. But in the weeks ahead, as the initial shock continues to wear off, we should be able to better gauge how the ongoing dynamics of these events are shaping the immediate economic outlook. For the longer term, prospects for ongoing rapid technological advance and associated faster productivity growth are scarcely diminished. Those prospects born of the ingenuity of our people and the strength of our system fortify a promising future for our free nation. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. The years at the New York Stock Exchange basically took off their respective competitive jerseys, be they Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, and so many of the other great broker-dealers who serve almost 85 million Americans in this uh, marketplace that, as you quite rightly say, has become the most important market in the world. They took off those team jerseys and they put on their Team America jerseys and made that marketplace reopen. What took 209 years to build was basically rebuilt in three and a half days because of thousands of wonderful men and women, not just within the securities industry, but from Verizon and Con Ed, and of course the great leadership that we had from the public sector. And that is my, uh, my privilege this afternoon. I first want to welcome all of you to this conference. This is a conference that has traditionally been one of the most important parts of our weekend because it allows the National Italian American Foundation in this its 26th annual gala weekend to bring together the leadership from corporate America, from institutional around the world and to focus on what is important to us. This conference, although as uh, Frank indicated, tentative, but generally on the whole, definitely encouraging. In the days following that attack, of course, the level of activity declined quite significantly. The shock was most evident in consumer markets as many potential purchasers stayed riveted to their televisions and away from shopping malls. Both motor vehicle sales and sales at major chain stores fell off noticeably. The airline and travel industries also suffered severe cutbacks. The unprecedented shutdown of American air travel and tightened border restrictions induced dramatic curtailments of production at some establishments with tight just-in-time supply chain practices 
most notably, most notably in the motor vehicle industry. As the initial shock began to wear off, economic activity recovered somewhat from the depressed levels that immediately followed the attacks, though the recovery has clearly been uneven to date. Markedly increased incentives induced a sharp rebound in motor vehicle sales by the end of last month that has carried apparently undiminished to date through October. However, many... Roger, I want you to remain seated. Francis, I would like you to stay on that table now. <laughs> okay. that's, that's called putting your best face forward, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. This is a record-breaking event because it is the first luncheon under the leadership of the new executive director of NIAF, John Solomon. John, congratulations <laughs> to you. Uh, but the, the father of this luncheon and the person who I now have the pleasure and honor of introducing, I, uh, I first met uh, Richard Grasso when he was president of the New York Stock Exchange. And I asked around because I always wondered what these titles mean. And uh, some people are presidents, some people are chairmen, etc. And they said, this means that he is Mr. Inside. He really runs the place. And without a question, he has been the best inside person that the New York Stock Exchange has ever had. And then the position of chairman came up, and some people view that as... And business spending continued to be weak in August. Consumer spending, however, moved higher that month and appeared to be reasonably well maintained in the first part of September. Industry analysts suggest that motor vehicle sales were running close to August levels and chain store sales were only modestly lower. New orders for non-defense capital goods stabilized in August. Moreover, the dramatic decline in the rate of profits was clearly slowing, and also slowing were expectations of where profits were going to emerge during the third and fourth quarters. To be sure, all of these signs were tentative, but generally on the whole, definitely encouraging. In the days following that attack, of course, the level of activity declined quite significantly. The shock was most evident in consumer markets as many potential purchasers stayed riveted to their televisions and away from shopping malls. Both motor vehicle sales and... Thank you very much. <clears throat> John, you, uh, you are very sweet, and I'm very humbled by your very beautiful words, but I would be the first to tell you that there were so many men and women in the business of Wall Street who, for perhaps the only time in my 34 years at the New York Stock Exchange, basically took off their respective competitive jerseys, be they Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, and so many of the other great broker-dealers who serve almost 85 million Americans in this uh, marketplace that, as you quite rightly say, has become the most important market in the world. They took off those Team jerseys and they put on their Team America jerseys and made that marketplace reopen. What took 209 years to build was basically rebuilt in three and a half days because of thousands of wonderful men and women, not just within the securities industry, but from Verizon and Con Ed, and of course the great leadership that we had from the public sector. 
And that is my, uh, my privilege this afternoon. I first want to welcome all of you to... We in the United States have assumed ourselves to be fairly well insulated from terrorism, or at most subject to limited and sporadic episodes, similar to those previously observed on a number of occasions in Europe. We have been aware of the possibility for losses on a much greater scale. But I suspect that those possibilities were deemed so remote that they were never seriously incorporated into most conventional assessments of economic risk. The shock of the tragedies at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon has reshaped those assessments of risk and required an abrupt realignment of prices in many markets to reflect the expected costs of operating in what we now recognize as a more hostile world. The circumstances pose a difficult challenge for business decision making, not so much because the costs are inordinately large, but because the events which have potentially substantial consequences are so uncertain. Insurance deals with this problem by spreading the risk and converting potential large unknown costs into a steady stream of known insurance